Charles for Governor Kathy Hochul. So what'd you think of that video, gang? Are you rocking now? Yeah. All right, all right. Well, let's party like it's 1917. How about that for our theme tonight? I am so delighted to be here. First of all, I want to extend a warm welcome from our governor, Andrew Cuomo, who wishes he could be here tonight, but uh, falls on my hands. I get to be the one to celebrate with all of you tonight, and I'm really delighted to be here. I also want to thank our host tonight for this phenomenal venue, the best view of the lights, the purple lights that are gracing our city of anywhere. SAP, our CEO, Bill McDermott, and Ann Rosenberg. Let's give them a huge round of applause. And I will be fairly brief with the acknowledgments, but I do want to recognize a couple of individuals who you'll be hearing from shortly. One is Carolyn Maloney, our Congresswoman, dear friend of mine. She has been a friend since we were roommates together in Congress. That's another whole story. That's probably a book. Well, we had a great experience together, and no, there's been no one is as big a champion for the advancement of women's rights, the ERA, and the National Women's Museum than Carol Maloney. So we are very fortunate and hope that you can join us shortly. I'm also excited to let you know you'll be hearing from the Democratic leader, Andrea Stewart Cousins. Some, she is here with us tonight. She has been a trailblazer in her own right. She has been a dear friend of mine and a great partner of our governors, and so she'll be, she's also an incredible mentor and role model to other women looking to run for office, so she'll be joining us shortly. I want to thank the members of the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission. This group has been working together for over a solid year, and there are countless members who are here, but Senator Betty Little is in the room tonight. She came all the way down from the North Country. She's been doing a great job. Our advisory board is here as well. Also, my colleagues in government, many elected officials, assembly women, senators, city council members, and I believe our borough president, Gail Brewer, will be joining us as well. We also have, yep. Yeah. We also have members of the governor's cabinet joining us here tonight, and I'm joined by my Pay Equity Commission co-chair, Roberta Reardon, Department of Labor Commissioner, Superintendent of Financial Services, Maria Volos here, and Commissioner of Parks, Rose Harvey is here. Let's give it up for these incredible individuals. I'm gonna give you a short history. It has been an honor to dive deep into the incredible legacy that we've inherited as New Yorkers. Because it was back in 1848 in a tiny place called Seneca Falls. Anybody been to Seneca Falls? Raise your hand if you've been to Seneca Falls. Okay. I've been there so often I could probably vote there tomorrow legally if I wanted to. Oh, but I won't. I won't. This is a place of great inspiration. But when you think about what went on there in 1848, imagine the challenge of assembling 300 women and a handful of enlightened men in a place that very few had heard of without social media. How is that possible? How did they do that? But they did it. And they penned something known as the Declaration of Sentiments. And this was their Bill of Rights. This was their Declaration of Independence. And if you ever read the words that are inscribed on the granite wall just out the place they gathered, you can feel the anger in their words because, ladies and gentlemen, they had had it. In 1848, they were saying, enough is enough, and we demand our rights. But it was a long, long journey, almost 70 more years of fighting, taking it to the streets, protesting, being arrested, imprisoned, ostracized by their families, their churches, their communities. But for 70 years, these suffragettes never gave up. That is the story we are celebrating tonight. It's part of our legacy as New Yorkers, and we've retained the mantle of not just the birthplace of women's rights, but a place that advances women's rights. And whether it's protecting reproductive health care, that movement started in your state, you should be very proud of that. Whether it's, whether it's fighting for equal pay, and now how about fighting to ensure freedom 
from sexual assault and harassment wherever it raises its ugly head in the workplace, in politics, on Wall Street or in Hollywood, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. In New York State, we are saying no more. And I am proud to have with us tonight so many other women who've shattered glass ceilings. We are joined by Congresswoman Elizabeth Holtzman, who was the youngest, youngest Congresswoman elected. Elizabeth, let's give you a shout out. And she held that record as being the youngest member elected to Congress for 40 years. Liz Abzug is here representing Bella Abzug's legacy. You gotta know this story. Writer Susan Brownmiller, who's written about sexual assault for decades. So many incredible women in this room. And yes, there's one person who is not here. But we are so enormously proud that the first woman to break the glass ceiling of being a woman nominee on a major party running for president, Hillary Clinton, New Yorker Hillary Clinton. She was our own. And in case you're also keeping score, the only women Supreme Court justices serving today are all New Yorkers, too. So there we go. So, but today we do so much more than stand on the shoulders of these audacious, bold women and those glass ceiling breakers. We also have young women with us today because it's time on this 100th anniversary of women winning the right to vote that we take the torch and pass it to the next generation. And with that torch comes a moral responsibility in honor of those who suffered and endured unspeakable abuses for standing up for women. We have a moral responsibility to take that torch and not just pass it on but to make sure that flame grows even brighter. It has to grow brighter while it's in our care. And that's what I feel we can do. We have women who are now running for office who never thought of it in the past, who never thought they would have the courage and the confidence to step forward. This generation is stepping up. And I love to see that. I love to see that. We have young women who are leading nonprofits and advocacy campaigns, young women journalists, who are making a difference by uncovering the stories that were not told by male colleagues in the past. And I'm also very excited today to say we need symbols of these individuals. We need symbols of this movement. And I was just with our borough president, Gail Brewer, and Carolyn Maloney a few hours ago in Central Park. Are you here? Oh. I knew you would not disappoint me, girl. You're here. I was just about to say what we did this afternoon. <laughs> I joined my good friends, Gail Brewer and Carolyn Maloney, along with the Susan B. Anthony and Kate, Elizabeth Cady Stanton Statue Fund, and they announced that there'd be a finally, finally, after years of their hard work, a statue in Central Park that memorializes these two individuals, these two suffragettes. And I say, that is long overdue, but these women did not give up the fight. Thank you so much. But I'm going to add my own little announcement on top of that. This is a big day for the statues. <laughs> New York State is also announcing today that most, two more individuals, Sojourner Truth, will be memorialized <laughs> in, in her home county of Ulster along the Empire State Trail and General Rosalie Jones. And if you know General Rosalie Jones, when you, and if you don't know her, when you go to vote tomorrow, you will receive one of these very cool stickers. And that's a picture of General Rosalie Jones who led a march from Long Island to Albany to make sure that women could have the right to vote. So make sure you wear this proudly too. And we'll have a statue to her. We'll have a statue built in her honor in her hometown in Cold Spring Harbor. Yay! So we got a little ways to go on the statue parody issue here. <laughs> got a little ways to go, but at least we're beginning to break it down. And those are two big announcements today, and I'm very proud they could join me here today. I also mentioned the Declaration of Sentiments. Where are the Declaration of Sentiments? Nobody knows. Nobody knows where the actual documents are. So I'm enlisting all of you. 
And the only way you can get something done is with a hashtag, right? Okay. <laughs> hashtag find the sentiments. We're launching it today. We are all going to become sleuths. We're going to find a way to find the original document penned in 1848. It is missing. And we are going to find it, and we're going to make sure that it is enshrined in New York State's history. So that's also what we're announcing tonight. I will conclude by saying, today is the first day of the next 100 years, right? Now, first days are great days to make resolutions. So can we make a few resolutions here tonight? Let's do that. Let's commit to our own version of the Declaration of Sentiments. Here's some I hope you'll share with me. My first resolution is to loudly proclaim that we have had enough. Let's just get that out there. We have had enough. It's over. It's over. And we want to live our lives free of sexual harassment and free of sexual assault. And that is our resolution going forward for the next 100 years. It's over today. It's over today. And we're going to fight to make sure the culture changes to allow this happen. The second resolution, we will be our sister's keepers. As we rise, we will help them rise with us. And those of us in elective office, and I've seen my colleagues do this so often, when we figure out that secret sauce of getting elected, we'll make sure we share that recipe with our sisters and help bring them up. Let's bring them up. Our third, third resolution is we'll rise up. We'll transform leadership in the corridors of power, whether it's in the boardrooms, whether it's in Cap Capitol Hill or our state capitol or in our cities. We are going to change the balance of power. We will lead with strength and inclusion. And most importantly, we will lead with integrity, because that's what women do. That's what women do when they lead. Fourth, fourth, we will call on men to join us. Just as it was the enlightened men, we call them the suffragettes, the enlightened men, who helped the women's movement back in 1848. In fact, Frederick Douglass is given the credit for when there was a vote on the sentiments and including the idea of women's right to vote, there was some talk that it actually might go down because it was just too radical. Frederick Douglass stood up and gave an eloquent, impassioned speech in support of it, and it was included. Men have been there every inch of the way along with the women. Let's not forget that. In fact, 100 years ago today, only men could vote, and they're the ones who voted for women to the right to vote. So we need them at our side. We need the men to help change our culture. We need the men with us. And lastly, tomorrow is election day. My last resolution is to find ways to break down the barriers to the ballot box. Let's find ways for the people who do want to vote, but the moms are getting the kids on the bus early in the morning. And then they go to work all day. And then they've got meetings at night. And then they're visiting their parents at the end of the day. Let's make it easier so they can vote earlier. Now I was going to say vote often. You can't do that. Vote earlier. <laughs> vote earlier, whether it's no excuse to have the ballot or access early. We're going to make sure that happens. We'll honor the legacy of the suffragettes who gave us the right to vote by making sure everyone has access. And I hope going forward, that every individual who understands this history will never, ever neglect their duty to vote in their honor. Every single person must feel the weight of that responsibility. And so I say to the thousands of people I've spoken to on this initiative over the last year and a half, we know we're looking back 100 years, 100 years from now, when we celebrate the bicentennial of women winning the right to vote, what will they say about our time? What will our legacy be? And I will say, only you can answer that question. But together, I have a strong feeling that they'll be honoring us for our accomplishments and our passion and our refusal to give up just as we're honoring the women from 100 years ago. So thank you very much for being here to share this with us tonight. We have 
some great individuals. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have some messages from incredible leaders all the way from Washington. You need to hear from a good friend of mine, Leader Nancy Pelosi. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Governor Cuomo and Lieutenant Governor Hochul, for your leadership to advance the rights of women. I'm so happy that you're there with Matilda. And thank you to the outstanding women of the New York Congressional Delegation for being a powerful voice for all women. 100 years ago today, the women of New York won the right to vote, leading the way for the nation three years later. Before and since, New York's women have unleashed their power as leaders in politics and in their communities, proving that there is nothing more wholesome to our democracy than the increased leadership of America's women. Today, the legacies of the great New York suffragist Susan B. Anthony, Sojourner Truth, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton continue to inspire us. Yet more work remains to be done to fulfill the promise of Seneca Falls. As we stand on the shoulders of generations of women who came before us, women who organized, marched, voted, and ran for office, we must continue to fighting to demand respect for our equal rights. Thank you, Congresswoman Karen Maloney, for your relentless leadership in this mission. We must keep up the fight for equal pay, for equal work, for affordable child care, paid family leave, quality health care, retirement security, and for our rightful place at the decision-making table. Thank you, Governor Cuomo and Governor Hochul, for your recognition that when women succeed, America succeeds. Thank you to all of you. Now we'll hear from our Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. Cue up the video, Senator. Hi, I'm U.S. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, and it's a privilege to send greetings to everyone attending the New York State Women's Suffrage Commission reception, celebrating a hundredth anniversary of women's right to vote in New York State. Thank you to Commission Chair Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul for your hard work in leading this initiative. I am so proud that the women's suffrage movement was born here in our state and that New York women gained the right to vote three years before the 19th Amendment was ratified. All these years later, it's now our responsibility to continue the fight for the next set of challenges we face in this country. Whether it's equal pay for equal work, paid family leave, an end to sexual harassment and sexual violence, or any other issue that matters to you. I commend the Women's Suffrage Commission for helping us commemorate women's suffrage in New York and beyond, and I wish you all the best for a memorable event. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Democratic leader of the state of New York, the Senate, Andrea Stewart Cousins. <laughs> When women vote, women win. When women vote, women win. Let's do it one more time. When women vote, women win. Yes. And that's why it was so hard to get the vote. OK? I want to thank the governor. I want to thank my good friend, the lieutenant governor, and so many of my colleagues here. I know that there, uh, some have been mentioned. Uh, I see the, the Bronx DA, Darcel Clark, here, and I saw, yes, there she is. Yeah, give it to her. The first woman there, right? <laughs> Okay, I see I'm going to get in trouble, but I do have to ask, is Westchester in the house? All right. Now I know I'm going to get in trouble. I'm just so happy to be part of this celebration. We cannot take 100 years for granted. And for anybody who thought that voting didn't matter, I think it's very clear we all woke up, no matter which side, understanding that it matters. 
And so tomorrow we have an opportunity. But we also have to, and, and, and the Lieutenant Governor talked about some of the people who came before us, but you know, I don't take this position for granted. I am the first woman leader elected to lead a legislative conference in New York State history. And that happened because of my wonderful colleagues in the Senate Democrats conference, most of whom are those enlightened men. Because our legislature is still less than 30% woman. So even in progressive New York, we have some work to do. And so I remind you that we stand on great shoulders. I remind you that Susan B. Anthony actually decided she was going to fight for women's votes when she was arguing for temperance, and they decided they did not have to listen to her because she was not a man. And she said, wait a minute. There's something wrong with this, with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, with so many others, a woman whose, whose, whose home I represent, Carrie Catt, Carrie Catt in Westchester. She figured out how to lobby. She decided on this state-by-state -state strategy. She figured if she got enough people in the street, if she got enough women knocking on doors and making those phone calls and lobbying state by state, she could make a difference. And she did. I stand on the shoulder of women like Sojourner Truth who had to tell people, and I know John Kelly explained to us that women were sacred. But she didn't feel so sacred. <laughs> and those women who were begging for their rights didn't feel that sacred either. But Sojourner, who had nothing, fought. Fought for her people, fought for her freedom, fought for women. And we've had wonderful women, whether it's Judith Kay, the late Judge Judith Kay, whether it's, it's our own Sonia Sotomayora. Yay, yeah. for Sonia. Whether it's Eleanor Roosevelt. Yes. Name your person. Bella. Bella Abzug. Give me another. Millie Freedom. Shirley. 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 First black woman in Congress. <laughs> Gloria, <laughs> Gloria Steinem. Madam C.J. Walker, first black woman millionaire. Okay. There are statues to be erected. There are battles to be won. There are fights that are yet to be fought. And the people, the warriors who led us in the battle that has brought us this far, expect for us to not get weary, to not turn back, to not forget. As we pass the tor torch, we pass an enlightened torch, but we lead by example. All right. Nobody can rest, because 100 years isn't a long time in our very young democracy. It is in our hands. It is in all of us to make sure that the promise of the past enlightens the promise of our future. Happy birthday to us. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Uh, I also want to recognize we have another Glass ceiling breaker among us. 
Darcel Clark, Clark, the Bronx District Attorney, first woman of color, elected DA in the state of New York. How about that? Let's give it up for her. As I mentioned before, we are joined by someone who is not just a champion for women's rights in the state of New York, she is a national treasure. And we are so fortunate to call Carolyn Maloney our own, but the rest of the nation knows that she is tirelessly fighting for enactment of the ERA because the battle is not over. And she also is fighting for the first ever Women's Hall of Fame, Women's Museum in our nation's capital. Ladies and gentlemen, Carolyn Maloney, our congresswoman. Thank you, Kathy, and uh, thank, thank you to everyone here, but I have to say, doesn't Kathy look great dressed all in purple? All in purple. And uh, we thank her and, and the governor for lighting up our city in purple. And uh, in fact, it's uh, the, the last time I saw them, we literally blew up a bridge. We did, the Cusco Bridge, but we're rebuilding it with 690 million in federal funds connecting Brooklyn and Queens. And we're moving forward in many ways, but we have to remember the incredible role that New York State played in the human rights movements. Two of the great civil rights movements began here in our great state. Seneca Falls, the rights for women, and Stonewall, the rights for gay and lesbians, right here in the city of New York. And the very first declaration that women should have the right to vote came out of the Women's Convention in Seneca Falls with the Declaration of Sentiments. And it led to the greatest enfranchisement in our history. Half the population gained the right to vote peacefully, and that was because of the, what started in New York, and it was so like New York, to pass it three years earlier than when it was ratified for the entire nation. So we have a lot to celebrate tonight and to be proud of, and I thank the governor and Kathy for the announcement of two important statues upstate. But along with Gail Brewer and Pam Elam and uh, Colleen uh, and others, we had a, a celebration in Central Park today where we, uh, announced an RFP and looked at the Village Green, the back, the window box of almost every New Yorker Central Park, and there will be a statue for two of the great leaders of the women's right to vote movement, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. <laughs> it, it's, it's very important when you think that in Central Park, I once did a study, that they have all these statues of uh, women, but they're all fairy tale figures, or, or lyrical. You know, they have Mother Goose. They have, uh, you know, they have Alice in Wonderland. They have a witch, but not the real contributions of women. And too often, whatever it is that we did was like quicksand. It was erased and forgotten. So with these statues, the story's going to be told. And I'm working to build on the mall in, in, of, of the Capitol, the first and only museum dedicated to the substantial contributions of women in science, art, all areas. When I started working on it 15 years ago, I thought it just wasn't on the mall. They had museums for everything, law and order, stamps, fabrics, you name it, but not half the population. I thought it's gotta be a museum someplace. There's not one in the United States dedicated to the achievements of women. We have sliver museums. We have one in Seneca Falls. We have one for the uh, Museum of Artists and their artwork in, New in Washington. We have Annie Oakley. We have Women of the West, but not one that's dedicated to our achievements, and it's long, long overdue. So, you know, but, but New York, as we celebrate this, uh, I, I was looking at it, and uh, you know, the, when the, we had about 100 years ago, the largest march of our time in 1915, tens of thousands of women marched up Fifth Avenue starting in Washington Square. 
They marched in groups of teachers, musicians, garment workers, women of the Gilded Age, and self-supporting women. By the time the marchers reached 59th Street, other marchers were still leaving the staging area at Washington Square. So this mass movement was not unique to New York City. The nationwide movement, which culminated in the 19th Amendment, consisted of, listen to this, and there are a lot of female legislators here, and they know how hard it is to pass a referendum. It consisted of 56 state referendum campaigns, 480 legislative campaigns for state suffrage amendments, 47 state constitutional convention campaigns, 277 state party convention campaigns to get suffrage planks in the party platform. So as Eleanor Roosevelt used to say, it's up to the women. It wasn't easy, and we're gonna have the same fight when we go forward. Our founding mothers were so brilliant. They wrote way back then, if we don't get our act together, we'll be back at Seneca Falls 150 years later and not have the Equal Rights Amendment, which was introduced in Seneca Falls by Alice Paul in the Presbyterian Church. And Alice Paul was a distant relative of my late husband, uh, uh, Cliff, and she uh, continued the work of these great ladies and is, is really credited with finally getting it passed. But she was sent to prison. She was sent to an insane asylum. She was proclaimed insane for thinking that women should have the right to vote. And the, uh, she was force-fed, like many of the leaders, arrested many times, like Susan B. Anthony was. And it was hard. But they said, if you don't, you would get the right to vote from which all other powers would come. And you need to be in the Constitution. And I want to tell you seriously, in this day of joy, that I have to spend three-fourths of my time in Congress trying to hold on to what our founding mothers before us in Congress passed to empower women. Constantly votes to chip away at a woman's right to choose, to chip away at Title IX, to chip away at T Title VII. Just recently, uh, Ms. DeVos, Secretary DeVos, swept away uh, the executive order that protected women on campuses uh, from sexual assault. And their Supreme Court cases where women have gone to the Supreme Court in cases of rape, where it was uncontested, he confessed, and it's thrown out because she doesn't have standing. Well, I say, let's get our standing in the Constitution. Let's put women into the Constitution. Don't let them get away with it. There is an uprising now of sexual harassment. It was used to be treated like it's part of the job. Don't complain, it's just there. But they, it was reported over and over again. They never did anything about it. We, if women are in the Constitution, then we would have the right to stand up for ourselves, even if DAs ignore it, even if police ignore it, even if city councils or state legislatures or the Supreme Court ignores it. We have to stand up and get it for ourselves. My whole life, I've worked for equal pay for equal work. We're 80 cents to the dollar. It's been that for 30 years, my entire active life, and it's worse for women of color. It's worse, uh, it's, it's, it's unfair, and it needs to stop. But in my modest opinion, it will never be enforced unless it is dead rock, a constitutional right. And if it is a right, then it's enforceable in the courts, even in the Supreme Court. They can't throw it out. It's a right. And I say, let's make it happen. I was really uh, thrilled by the, the excitement today in Central Park. And I, I looked at the pictures of Su Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and I think each of us needs to ask ourselves, what goal or purpose is so important to us that we can give the energy and commitment that they did to give us the right to vote? And for me, it's the Equal Rights Amendment. We're going to the fearless girl down there. There's, they say, they say they're, they're going to move her. And I say, we say, don't move her until we pass and ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. So join me down at the fearless girl. 
Not this coming Friday, but the next Friday, we're going to speak out, we're going to organize, we're going to pass the Equal Rights Amendment and thank the founding mothers for giving us the right to vote and, and the power to stand up and fight for other women and other causes that can make the kind of difference that theirs did. Thank you so much. I just had an amazing thought. Can you imagine how incredible our country would be if half of our Congress was filled with people like Carolyn Maloney? Yeah. <laughs> and how our state would be if half of our Senate and our Assembly were filled with people like Democratic leader Andrew Stewart Cousins. Yeah. These are incredible, incredible. Yeah. So let's resolve to continue fighting until at least half, and how about more than half, of our legislative bodies and elected positions are filled with people that look like us. What a credible idea that could be. So on that thought, I'd like to propose a toast. And it occurs to me that some of you may not have a drink in your hand. <laughs> we can fix that. Hold up your cell phones. Hold up your cell phones and turn on the lights, OK? In honor. And let us toast to the next 100 years. Here, here. <laughs> and now with that, we are going to do one more thing, but I have to say, when you look around this city tonight, when you're heading home, embrace the feeling of the color of purple and gold. You are surrounded by it, whether it's the World Trade Center, whether it's the bridges, whether it's the Empire State Building, and if you go north, you will see it in Albany, and you'll see it all over Syracuse, and Rochester, and my hometown of Buffalo, where I'll be around midnight tonight. And you will also see it on Niagara Falls tonight. Celebrate, yes. And the people, I need to tell you, it doesn't happen by magic. <laughs> I want to thank my incredible team for the hard work that they have done making not just the lights, but this celebration such a success. I want to mention a few people, starting with Jeff Lewis, my chief of staff. Jeff, thank you very much. I want to thank Barbara Williams, the executive director of the Women's Suffrage Commission. Barbara. I want to thank the extra help we received from the governor's team, Rachel McPherson. Thank you very much, Rachel, and Bibi, and others. My deputy chief of staff, who lit up upstate New York, Melissa Bochensky. Sinead Doherty, who's keeping it all together for me. Jelani Deshong and Veronica Ng. I have such an incredible team. And Jen, where's my communications director? Jen, where are you? Jen O'Sullivan? Where are you, Jen? I know she's here. I know she's here. Jen O'Sullivan and Deborah. We have an incredible team of individuals. Let's give it up for Team Lieutenant Governor Hochul, because you guys did an awesome job. Awesome job. So I have a sweet tooth. So I thought we should celebrate the rest of the evening by eating cake. Yeah. So, so I'd like to call up Gail Brewer to join us here, Carolyn Maloney, Andrew Stewart Cousins, and all the elected officials that we can pack on this stage. And let's cut the cake. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>